Hi, good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our fourth webinar in our series on CAR T cell therapies, exploring CAR T cell therapy during the COVID-19 pan pandemic. What's on the horizon for CAR T cell therapies? I'm your moderator, Daria Zangari, Scientific Director for Onc Live, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you tonight. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with expert insights on relevant topics in today's cancer care and treatment. We will cover a list of topics that our panel will go into greater detail on, sharing their insights from the front lines. Our topics tonight include some of the ASCO 2020 highlights. So we'll have some of the key abstracts identified by our panel that they will discuss, ongoing clinical trials at their institutions and trials that are open and enrolling, and the rationale behind some of the new targets and novel therapies and how they might have an impact on the treatment landscape. So if you're listening to this webinar, we do encourage you to submit any questions you may have. We will try to answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion of this webinar. So joining us for our fourth week, we have our panel again. Uh, I'll have the doctors introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start off with Dr. Lunning. Hello, Matt Lunning from the University of Nebraska uh, Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm a lymphoma and cellular therapy physician. Great, thanks. Dr. Nastupil. Hi, Loretta Nastupil from Houston, Texas, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in the Department of Lymphoma Myeloma. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Galal. I'm Ed Galal from Durham, North Carolina with Duke University, uh, Lymphoma and Cellular Therapy. Um, and I'm uh, a professor of the uh, medicine at uh, Duke University. Great, thank you. So to recap for our audience, in the previous weeks, we've had our panel here um, and joining us again. We've talked about the impact of COVID on cellular therapeutics and some of the real world, world data that we've seen with the available CAR T cell therapies. We've also discussed patient cases, looking at vein to vein time, bridging therapy and adverse event management. So this week we look to obtain our faculty perspectives on some of the important abstracts that have come out of ASCO and to see what's next for CAR T cell therapies. So let's begin. We will have uh, Dr. Nastupal um, present the first sets of abstracts and have a discussion on those. Thank you. So Karen Jacobson presented on behalf of the Zuma 5 investigators, the phase two study of axicaptogene saluxal, which is the anti-CD19, CD28 costimulatory CAR, in patients with relapsed or refractory follicular and marginal zone lymphoma patients. So outlined on the slide, you see the abstract as updated with the slides that she presented. I think the most striking thing about the Zuma 5 study is that she reported an overall response rate of 95% and a complete response rate of 81% in patients uh, with follicular lymphoma. Recognizing that the median follow-up was about 15 months at the time of the presentation, uh, the median progression in free survival was approximately 25 months. And these were patients that were heavily pretreated with the median number of prior lines of therapy being three uh, in both the follicular marginal zone cohorts. The other striking thing is that the toxicity profile seemed to be slightly different from what we've seen uh, particularly with axi cell and large cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. But even within this study, and Matt has talked about this previously, we've learned how to manage toxicity associated with CAR-T. But even when you look at the toxicity within a given trial, there was a differentiated safety profile with follicular patients experiencing less grade three or higher cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity in comparison to the marginal zone lymphoma patients. In addition, the onset of toxicity in these inland lymphomas seem to be a little bit later than what we've seen uh, with the large cell lymphoma patients. So again, quite striking um, with this phase two study, uh, relatively small sample size, but quite high efficacy um, and toxicity profile being a little more favorable in these indolent lymphomas. Guess before we move on, um, to my panel, what are your thoughts about the Zuma 5 study? It's very encouraging. And actually, um, I think it's going to be more exciting than the diffuse large B cell lymphoma for the reasons that you mentioned. Um, in the follicular lymphoma, there is nothing that gives us uh, this kind of response uh, at the level where we have re relapsed refractory. I'm sure you know that. Um, same thing with the marginal zone lymphoma. So I'm, I'm actually very 
um, encouraged by these results, and I wish we can have uh, longer follow-up with the same numbers. Oh, I agree. So move on to the abstract presented by Fred Locke, which was looking at retreatment with AxiCell among the patients that were enrolled in the Zuma-1 study. And again, Zuma-1 was the pivotal phase 1-2 study that led to FDA approval uh, for patients with large cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal, or transformed follicular. Among the patients on or enrolled in the Zuma-1 study, there were 14 patients that received retreatment with AxiCell. So to qualify for retreatment, these were patients that had to have biopsy to prove that they still had CD19 expression. Uh, again, this is a small cohort of patients uh, that were alive and well enough to undergo retreatment. What he reports is that among the patients that had achieved a complete response with their first infusion, uh, those were the only patients that responded to a second infusion. It's hard to really note much about the durability of that second CAR-T infusion because among those seven patients who responded, most had gone on to some form of consolidation, primarily uh, with allogeneic stem cell transplant. So there was at least one patient among those seven who had an 18-month uh, durability of response without consolidation. Uh, so what you could conclude from this small sample size is that it was feasible to retreat patients who had CD19 expression uh, despite failing a prior uh, infusion of an auto CD19 car, and the toxicity profile uh, seemed to be much less uh, with the retreatment as was uh, cytokine production. So again, maybe a retreatment strategy would be uh, better tolerated. I think the primary question is, is durability. Matt, any, any thoughts about retreatment among the Zuma-1 cohort? Yeah, I think you kind of you know, logically what happened happened, right? Those those people who still had CD19 expression, those who had deeper or deeper and longer emissions, you know, were those who were gonna gonna benefit. So the kind of the story played out as you would expect it. I think the law of diminishing returns is still, just like we see often with chemotherapy, is likely still present uh, with CAR T cell therapy. I think that this is though ushers in the, the, the wave that you can do a CAR T cell after a CAR T cell. So, as we get newer CAR T cells coming in or with different uh, mechanisms or dual, you know, you know, going after 1920 or 1922, it shows that there is a population that can get a second, uh, a second CAR. I think that was really the, the key point about this is, 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 again, I talked about this yesterday. We shouldn't be excluding people to CAR T cell therapies that have had prior CAR T. I agree. And then another abstract that was presented at ASCO was a retrospective analysis across a few centers looking at the outcomes among elderly patients who received uh, AxiCell or t cell um, standard of care CAR-T. So there's been a number of reports that age should not be a discriminating factor for who's an appropriate candidate for CAR-T cell therapy, uh, meaning that patients over the age of 65 tend to have as good, if not sometimes even better outcomes, recognizing that's probably a highly selected patient population with limited comorbidities um, in good performance status on the prospective studies. So this group, which was led by the University of Utah, set out to look at patients over the age of 70, including those between 70 and uh, 75, and then those over the age of 75. Again, this is retrospective, relatively small sample size, but they did identify 30 patients. Uh, among them, 79% received AxiCell, 35% um, received I'm sorry, the remaining received uh, tisogen leclusal, 35% were activated B-cell subtype, 16% were double or triple hit. And they did report on the uh, comorbidity, the SIRS index, uh, to try and identify what these patients look like in terms of uh, comorbid illness that were still deemed appropriate candidates for CAR T-cell therapy. Uh, so what they found is that the older patients, meaning those over 75, tend to have inferior survival in comparison uh, to the younger patients. Similarly, uh, PFS looked to be 
quite comparable, suggesting that there are competing risks of death, but also the toxicity profile seem to be worse, particularly in those patients over the age of 75. Uh, so I think, again, this just provides more information about the outcomes in patients over the age of 70. As much as we like to tout that you should not use age as a defining factor, I do think that you do need to be mindful of the unique toxicities associated with CAR T-cell therapy, uh, particularly in patients on the extreme ends of the spectrum. So, Ahmed, any, any other thoughts or comments on this abstract? I think this uh, might help the um, sort of the approval of some of the older patients through uh, the committees that would uh, evaluate that, uh, because we had a hard time to get older patients through the CAR T at one point. So this would be a, a very, you know, a clear study to sort of support what we're saying about the age, uh, keeping in mind that the side effects are a little bit higher in the older age, but if they have really good performance status and they don't have much of comorbidity, so low comorbidity score, it's worth uh, offering them this type of therapy. So I, I think it's, it's feasible and it's very important uh, sort of uh, study to tell us what we do with the older patients. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that kind of jumped out at me is even though, again, you know, we've talked a little bit about, about comparing toxicity across constructs and how challenging that is with the prospective studies, but there is this perception that AxiCell is poorly tolerated. And so, again, I think the fact that, you know, almost 80% of patients in the study uh, received AxiCell speaks to sort of practice patterns and the comfort levels with one uh, construct or another uh, in our current practices. I think it also highlights the, the likely trend in toxicity management that has evolved since Zuma 1, uh, um, you know, kind of in this, uh, likely in this population. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, so this is, uh, um, we're discussing the updated results from the pilot study. So the pilot study has been previously uh, presented um, Going, you're going, going wild on the slides. So uh, the pilot study is for patients with relapse uh, refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Again, high grade B cell lymphoma or full color grade uh, 3B. Uh, what's unique about this study is that this is in the second line transplant not eligible population that had previously received uh, an anthracycline and, and an anti CD20 um, um, agent. And so, um, the, the three qualifying factors that made uh, transplant not eligible, you had to either be, I believe is greater than, uh, uh, greater than or equal to 70. Um, there was some uh, ECOG uh, e performance status uh, would not allow for a transplant or um, other uh, comorbidities uh, like renal function. And so uh, in this study, 25 patients um, met at least one of those criteria, you could meet more than one, up to all three of them. Uh, I believe the most common uh, reason for being transplant not eligible was age um, over or equal to 70. So 25 patients had lymphodepleting uh, chemotherapy followed by lysocell infusion. You can see here that the median age was 72 with a good uh, range with the upper bound at, at uh, 85. 48% um, of them had high tumor burden and 48 were primary refractory. Um, adverse event-wise, 72% had uh, a grade three or greater uh, treatment emergent event. Uh, the majority of them appeared to be uh, cytopenias, which, which can be expected uh, in the age of this population, but um, uh, and known uh, with the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Importantly, there were no grade five adverse events that occurred within the first uh, 30 days. 20% um, of the patients had uh, CRS and three had uh, neurologic events. There were no grade three, four CRS uh, events observed and 8% uh, or two patients had um, grade three, four neurologic events. Um, when you look at kind of uh, use of uh, tocilizumab or steroids for either CRS or neurologic events, only 20% of the patients um, had, uh, had that uh, used. And you can see the median follow-up uh, was very short, so 3.5 months. Um, the uh, initial uh, overall response rate was 80% with about a half of the patients achieving a complete response. So kind of a, a different uh, um, set of eligibility. Uh, uh, Loretta, what do you think about uh, kind of each one of those um, factors kind of declaring you as transplant ineligible? Mm 
Yeah, I think it's it's um, easy to make a conclusion that someone with poor performance stat um, issues with cardiopulmonary or hepatic and renal reserve are not ideal candidates. Again, I struggle a little bit with age um, alone as a factor because uh, there are functional um, measures that are probably better determinants of whether or not someone's appropriate for high dose chemotherapy. I also recognize that it's pretty uncommon to take someone in their 70s or older to high dose therapy. So I think at some point you draw a line in the sand, it's probably a reasonable uh, definition that they used. Uh, Ahmed, any, uh, any comments? No, not really. I'm, you guys said it all. <laughs> So Matt, right. we'll throw yeah. it back at you. So does this now change anything in terms of practice? Um, so for instance, if the randomized trials are positive studies, you now have a second line. Do you broaden this out to any second line patient based off of this study? I mean, this is, I think that's where they're trying to go is kind of proving that even in the transplant not eligible uh, population, you can, you can do this. So you know, whether or not this will broaden uh, you know, if you will, a label, um, it definitely is, is likely be supporting data uh, for that second line um, population. All right, so moving on. So uh, Zuma 2 is published by Dr. Wong uh, and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine, which generated a lot of uh, excitement uh, for patients uh, and patients. Uh, uh, practitioners who take care of people with relapse and refractory mantle cell lymphoma. So just before we go on uh, to talk about the abstract that was presented recently, um, just a, a, a refresher on the results of the Zoom 2 trial. So there are 74 patients that were reported in the New England Journal pa uh, paper. You can see here that uh, KTX19, uh, a little bit different of a, of a product uh, than what was used in um, Zoom 1. Um, was administered minister to 68 uh, patients. 93% um, uh, 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 were reported in the, uh, in the primary efficacy analysis and had an overall response of 60, uh, and 67% had a complete response. Uh, so that's a pretty impressive overall response rate uh, and, and CR rate. Um, in the intent to treat analysis of the 74 uh, patients, 85% have an, o an oral response with 59% having a, a complete remission. Now this follow-up uh, is you know, a little bit longer um, and will continue to grow, so about a year um, with 57% of the patients remaining in, in remission at that time point. You can see here the estimated PFS and OS at 12 months of 61 and, and 83%. And I believe all these patients had prior BTK exposure. So uh, um, that was an important um, uh, to, to note. From an adverse event standpoint, um, grade three or higher events were again cytopenias, uh, likely reflecting the previously treated uh, population, but also the lymphodepleting chemotherapy with 32% of the patients having infections. Um, grade three or higher CRS was seen in 15% in neurologic events in 31% of the patients. There were two grade five infectious adverse events that occurred in the Zuma 2 trial. So before jumping forward, and I know that this is a, a published manuscript, but any uh, thoughts, Ahmed, about, uh, about this data and its place in mantle cell lymphoma? So you mentioned that uh, most of these patients with mental cell lymphoma had uh, t uh, BTK inhibitors uh, prior to the CAR T. Is that true? I believe that was part of the eligibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the other question, sorry. The other question that I uh, wonder, I mean, what about post CAR T uh, BTK inhibitor? Uh, if these patients were not eligible for that after the CAR T, we know that sometimes we use it post CAR T relapses. Um, and whether this is a better strategy than having it before the uh, CAR T or not, I think that's a question that probably we'll know about later on. Um, I was on the Zuma 2 uh, trial, and I'm again I'm I'm impressed with the results uh, of that for the few patients that I put on. So uh, I think this will be a very um, uh, good uh, treatment uh, for our patients. Yeah, I really want to see, and I don't think it was in the manuscript, um, you know, how many of the patients were TP53 mutated, uh, um, because I think that's the pop a population where, given these results, 
um, you know, for potential to move up in a in a high risk uh, a population in mantle cell lymphoma. Loretta, any comments on Zuma two? Yeah, so I, you mentioned this. So it is a little bit different uh, manufacturing in different products. So they essentially have to um, expunge any lymphoma cells so that you don't have a contaminated product. And how that contributes, I don't know that we fully recognize, but we do know that you know mantle cell lymphoma can have circulating cells, and so. Obviously, if you can do anything to try and minimize the risk for contaminating their product, that's probably a reasonable thing. Um, the response were very high. The 12 month um, CR rate drops off a little bit. So, again, be interesting to see can those relapse happen. And is this more of an ALL type story as opposed to the large cell where we're fully confident that? there's a plateauing of that response curve in, in definitive therapy or these patients continued relapse over time. I actually don't know the answer to that. Right. So kind of um, coming out of Zuma 2, they then looked at the product characteristics and the pharma pharmacologic profile of the uh, KTX-19 product uh, in the registrational Zuma 2 trial. Um, so in the manufacturing process, the KTX-19 product showed a slight bias uh, towards uh, CD8 and effector memory, uh, effector phenotype. Um, I think that they're, you know, because when we will talk about lysosel product, which is a split product of fours and eights, you know, the question about whether or not the ratios of four to eights mattered in, in regards to the efficacy, you can see here the median ratio is point, uh, point 0.7, so a little bit skewed uh, towards the CD8 population. They went further in looking at the, the phenotype um, uh, of the individual uh, components um, within the product. From an MRD assessment, so minimum residual disease, you can see that those that were MRD negative uh, versus positive at, at one month um, had increased uh, median cytokine level levels in IL-15, IL-2, interfering gamma, IL-10, and IL-6, and peaking uh, in the serum uh, at seven days uh, post-treatment. Post so, I guess a little bit uh, what you would um, have suspected from from prior uh, prior data uh, um, from that standpoint. Uh, patients who were MRD negative by one month post treatment had increased uh, peak levels and in, in, of gramzyme B and soluble PDL one. So that's um, uh, the gramzyme B. I don't know that I've I've seen uh, that before, but um, but these cytokine assays I think are expanding and trying to find and predictors of those patients who aren't going to do well early on and potentially, you know, uh, coming up with strategies where you could intervene early on to either try to rejuvenate the health of the CAR T cell or uh, find other adjunctive strategies um, in that patient population. So uh, um, are anybody doing certain analyses like this uh, on the commercial product uh, at your institution, Loretta? Are you guys doing anything kind of post uh, looking at cytokine levels or? Uh... Yes, we, we do collect serial blood samples starting uh, during the lymphocyte depleting on day zero and then several uh, samples post infusion. We don't have this information in real time, meaning when I'm rotating on the service, I don't know what the IL-15 interferon gamma IL-6 levels are doing. Uh, to make treatment decisions, but it is information that we uh, can look at retrospectively to try and identify, as you mentioned, re predictors of response. The other thing that I think is useful that uh, Michael Green is doing in our group is looking at cell-free DNA to see if you can identify again, changes in mutation burden uh, profiles that might predict for those early failures, because we know there are a number of patients that even progress within the first 30 days or between day 30 and 90. And again, those are the patients that I struggle the most with in terms of what should their next treatment strategy be. So maybe if you can get information in terms of, again, why they might fail this type of immune therapy approach, or if a combination strategy might, or sequential strategy might be um, helpful. I, I think those types of assays maybe more clinically meaningful. Ahmed, are you doing any uh, um, analysis kind of post-commercial post CAR-T or? 
Um, so what we're doing actually is the cytokine, as Loretta was mentioned, the only problem is we cannot really use it as a re in real time because uh, the test would come back really later on after the event and wouldn't be useful. But I think uh, uh, understanding the behavior of the cytokines during that period of time is very important. So I'm sure we're going to get something out of it to, to learn. Uh, so that, that's what we're doing. That's the only thing we're doing right now. Yeah, I think the other thing that, that's going to come out of this, too, is kind of what's in the bag versus what survives in the patient and what expands, you know, um, and, and, you know, what's driving the release of, of, these, of these cytokines or of that chain is going to be interesting um, also because one could imagine it may be similar across constructs, but it, but it actually may be uh, different, uh, too. All right. Um, so kind of diving into a little bit into the toxicity. So six patients did develop grade four neurologic events, including one case of cerebral edema. Um, three of them had concurrent grade four CR CRS. Uh, so they're higher peak uh, cytokine levels uh, versus the patients without grade four neuro uh, neurologic events. Um, there was lack of reversion to baseline by day 28 of IL-6 and uh, a serum VCAM1 level. Um, Peak CAR T cells in the blood and serum cytokines were generally comparable in the high versus low risk patients. So uh, there was uh, six uh, TP53 mutated patients versus unmutated uh, patients, as well as I kind of go through their high KI67 versus low uh, index here. So um, there was some T53 uh, people uh, in Zuma 2 that was called out uh, here. Are you guys uh, uh, um, testing for T53 in mantle cell? at diagnosis or only at relapse or? Uh, we do it at diagnosis and um, at relapse, we might repeat that for other part of the whole panel again. All right, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Galal. Okay, so I'll take it from here. This uh, an abstract about uh, um, allergenic uh, CAR T, which is the off-the-shelf uh, CAR T. This is a study basically uh, that showed first in human data on the ALO501 and the ALO647 for relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. Uh, this study basically uh, looked at this population, and the aim of this study is to look at the logistics that um, involved in the O2 uh, CAR T, which we know that manufacturing time is uh, some, somehow is limiting the success of this treatment. So the ALO501 is genetically modified anti-CD19 CAR T uh, cell product. Um, has a TCR constant uh, gene disrupted to uh, reduce the GBHD. I'm sorry. Reduce the GVHD and the uh, CD52 gene uh, is disrupted as well to permit uh, the use of allo uh, CAR T uh, with the 647 product, which is anti CD52 monoclonal antibody. The relapsed refractory uh, large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma who received um, uh, two lines of therapy or more, uh, they were refractory to their treatment at that point. They were allowed on the study. And basically, you look at the lymphodepleting chemotherapies, like the standard that we use, a little bit higher doses of uh, fludarabin and cyclophosphamide, uh, but that's the same uh, that will... Dr. Galal, did we lose him? We got a frozen. Uh-oh. It only took four weeks for this to happen. <laughs> okay, does one of you want to go over this yeah, one? I, I can jump in. So this was the uh, result of the phase one dose escalation of this uh, novel construct, as, as Dr. Galal mentioned. They did allow for both large cell and follicular lymphoma patients in this study, um, and they though the response rates were quite good, the 
short, the follow-up is quite short, and we did not get a great breakdown of how many of the responses were follicular versus large cell lymphoma. But I think it's a proof of concept that you can use a healthy donor T cell, you can genetically modify it so that you could reduce the risk for GVHD, you could potentially do better lymphodepleting by using their anti-CD52 um, antibody, uh, which may lead to better persistence. Uh, they did report some information on persistence uh, with the abstract presentation, including uh, one patient that had cells out 56 days. Again, relatively short follow-up on this study, uh, but I think that will be the ultimate question. The other sort of unique aspects of this product is it was first developed in leukemia, and so they did have a potential safety switch with rituximab. So patients who had had recent rituximab or had high circulating levels of rituximab were not eligible for this study. Um, so with the next iteration, uh, that's being programmed out because you can imagine most of these patients will have seen rituximab, including those that were relatively recent. Uh, so to be eligible for this study, again, probably a little bit easier to enroll follicular patients that may have had more targeted therapies recently uh, than a large cell that's blowing through a couple lines because all of which would have probably contained rituximab. So the conclusion is this is safe. I mean, they had essentially no high-grade neurotoxicity observed thus far, and the rates of grade three or higher CRS were quite low. Um, and it's a very novel technology and potentially will be able to treat more patients more rapidly. Yeah, I think that as we discussed on the prior prior talks that, uh, um, you know, that vein to vein time can be a, can be important um, in getting patients kind of with less uh, less bulkier disease too, uh, from, from that standpoint. So I can, I can, Dr. Galal, unless you're back on, I'll do the, uh, Alexander study. So, uh, this is a phase one study uh, called the Alexander study, uh, or the auto three construct. This had 28 patients that underwent uh, leukophoresis with 27 that were uh, successfully uh, manufactured with one in process at the time of reporting. Uh, 19 patients had received uh, treatment. Median age, as you can see here, was uh, 57 with the prior, median prior lines of therapy of three, but as you can see here, the upper bounds of 10, so a fairly uh, uh, refractory population. Um, of that, 74% represented large cell with 26 having transformed uh, uh, lymphomas. Uh, there was dose escalated from 50 to 450 million uh, cells. What was unique about this was kind of the introduction of pembrolizumab, so a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, into the regimen a little bit later uh, in some of the cohorts, but then um, I believe happening on day one uh, in some of the other cohorts. So as a dose escalated, I believe 150 to 450 million cells was kind of the range that they were considering moving forward with. And so kind of all comers uh, through this escalation uh, study, um, greater than uh, grade three treatment emergent adverse events was seen in greater than 50% of the patients, including cytopenias, as uh, we would expect it with neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia with lymphodepleting chemotherapy. 16% of the patients had febrile neutropenia. Uh, notably, there was 0% uh, um, severe CRS and no neurotoxicity. So again, kind of shepherding in these new con, uh, generation of constructs, you're seeing kind of uh, a, a little bit different potential uh, toxicity profile, which kind of goes to that, um, you know, maybe how the, the construct is being uh, uh, manufactured. Um, across the, across the, uh, uh, the treatment cohorts, the overall response rate is 64% with 55% having CRs. So and all of the CRs uh, continue to be ongoing. So again, kind of an interesting uh, uh, study of a new uh, kind of, um, if you will, generation of, of CAR T cell. Loretta, you want to tackle Zuma 7? Sure. So Zuma 7 is one of those randomized studies that we've been alluding to over the past few weeks. So this is for patients who are at second line with large cell lymphoma. Now they had to have progressed uh, within 12 months of their frontline 
CHOP like therapy. So it could have been CHOP, could have been dose adjusted EPOC. And again, this is to try and tease out those patients that, based off of the CORAL study, uh, had relatively poor outcomes with standard salvage chemotherapy followed by high dose therapy auto transplant. Uh, so if patients uh, meet that eligibility criteria, they are randomized in a one to one fashion to AxiCell um, or standard of care, which included uh, salvage chemotherapy. Um, and those that had chemosensitive disease moving on to high dose therapy, auto stem cell rescue. So this, again, is the first setting where we're seeing uh, how CAR-T will perform uh, in the second line. Uh, some of the nuances similar to other Zuma studies is if you got randomized to the CAR-T arm, uh, the only potential bridging therapy that was allowed uh, uh, was no salvage chemotherapy uh, in that arm. We do not have the results yet of this study. It has completed enrollment. Um, the other nuance to the study design is crossover was not built into the study design, meaning if you were randomized to the high-dose therapy auto transplant arm um, and you progressed, you did not were not allowed on protocol to cross over to receive AxiCell, uh, though you could pursue that as a standard of care uh, treatment. But I think that has uh, generated a lot of debate uh, surrounding this study, uh, but one of the uh, endpoints is overall survival. And, and when you allow for crossover with a potentially uh, curative therapy, it does muddy the statistics, uh, which was partly the rationale for not allowing uh, crossover in this study. Yeah, I think, it, I think it will be very interesting to see what percentage of those patients got to commercial CAR-T uh, that were initially in the Kind of the standard of care arm, and I think that can be, you know, maybe one of the points of contention as this is reported, reported out. Yeah, and as you mentioned, some of the other studies uh, that are also looking at CAR T in this second line setting uh, uh, do allow for crossover or even have cells collected and are ready for manufacturing. Uh, so there will be a, a lag time or a delay for those patients who are having to pursue standard of care axi cell or CAR T um, if, that were you know enrolled on the Zuma Seven study and failed. Uh, so that again is a bit of an ethical discussion, uh, but recognizing um, at the time these studies were, were designed, um, no one knew exactly what it was going to look like in, in third-line large cell lymphoma. Absolutely. Loretta, do you know, I'm just curious, because you could have a, a commercial or a, a clinical trial for a CAR T cell, and if, if a patient got Zuma 7 and then got standard of care and progressed, could they get a go on a different clinical trial and get a different CAR T cell in, in third line? Sure. I mean, it's it's not placebo or blinded, so we would know if they had not had CAR T up until that point. Um, now, again, it does raise the questions as to how these patients are followed and how you capture data in Zuma Seven once they've enrolled on another study. That gets really complicated in terms of contracts and and who who has access to that data. But yes, I can imagine that once you fail the standard of care arm and you're looking for alternative options, um, anyone's gonna be looking hard for CAR-T. Um, and right now, given how insurance delays can happen, sometimes it's more economically feasible to pursue CAR-T on protocol. So you can imagine at centers like ours, that's the first thing we do is look to see, well, what studies do we have available that have CAR-T among the treatment options? Yeah, so I think that's another kind of asterisk that's going to be interesting as this data starts, you know, uh, um, you know, to to come out from this 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 trial is kind of where did the patients go um, in the in the standard of care arm um, will be interesting. So, mm -hmm. all right, so I can I can tackle the uh, uh, the transcend CLL uh, study. So this is again using uh, lysocell, which is still an investigational um, anti CD nineteen. A CAR T cell. Uh, again, this is a, a CAR T cell. It's the defined uh, composition, so you get half CD4s and half CD8. So they're manufactured separately and then uh, reinfused uh, as separate infusions. Um, you get half, uh, so I think it's uh, um, 100 million, and you get 50 and 50. Um, in this study, eligible patients were uh, CLL greater than two prior lines of therapy, which had to include an, a, a BTK inhibitor. Um, form status, uh, you can see here, there was two dose levels, so 50 million as a split product and then 100 million uh, CAR T cells, 16 patients received lysocell, 75% of them had high risk uh, features, 100% had seen prior brutinib, 50% prior uh, venetoclax. Pr median prior lines of therapy was four and a half, so I would argue uh, 
kind of uh, in this population, a fairly heavily pretreated uh, population, probably more heavily pretreated than we've seen in, in um, other uh, CAR T cell uh, trials to date. Uh, you can see here the best overall response rate within those who are valuable was 87% with seven, pa uh, seven uh, patients achieving a complete remission or a complete remission without, uh, with incomplete recovery of counts. 83% um, remained in remission at, at six months, um, kind of going along with the undetectable MRD that's starting to uh, appear in, in, as an import, potentially important in CLL. 67% uh, uh, achieved an undetectable MRD at day 30 uh, in the blood and 88% uh, in the bone marrow. And they were able to demonstrate MRT negativity in those patients who are both kind of double failures to BTK uh, and a BCL2 uh, inhibitor. Yeah, I, I think you raise a good point, uh, particularly for CLL, given many patients do really well with uh, BTK inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors. At some point, they're going to fail those. And so then in the absence of having novel therapies that are emerging, I think this could potentially fill an unmet need. And also particularly for those P53, 17P mutated patients that are probably going to fail those therapies at a more rapid pace than those that don't have those uh, genetic aberrations. So I, I think this is quite interesting, and particularly if the toxicity uh, continues to be uh, as good as it looks currently. Yeah, I think the other the other thing that's going to be, you know, we've seen some of the Richter's data starting to come out of of Transcend, you know, uh, just the, the large cell a study, which did allow uh, Richter's, even though there were very there were very few of them, um, is kind of what is the timing in CLL. And maybe, you know, we're going to need to start to follow, you know, you know, we've been trying to educate on reassessment for uh, deletion 17P or T53 and CLL as the clone evolves. You know, so now, um, you know, is the goal to try and catch them before they turn to Richter's and get them their CAR T cell because the CAR T cell may not be as effective if you get to that, uh, that, time, that, that point. Mm -hmm. And there's also interesting data that came out of Ohio State looking at combination strategies, particularly with BTK inhibitors. Um, so again, recognizing that some of these patients are going to fail BTK inhibitors, or maybe they haven't failed and they've become intolerant, but could you potentially make those uh, cells more fit um, by sort of um, harvesting them in the setting of BTK inhibition um, and then potentially even infusing them with the BTK inhibitor on board. We've seen, at least with the phase one data, that looks like that might mitigate some of the toxicity we see with some of these CAR T series. Well, there's potentially even more interesting application of CAR T, recognizing that, that those patients are probably doing quite well with the standard therapies that currently exist. So you had mentioned some of the, uh, you know, to, the transform and, and Belinda trials that you're referencing from uh, Zuma 7. I think at, at transform, you know, and, and Belinda both, as you pointed out, uh, allow crossover uh, when a when a uh, event has occurred. Um, so I think that those you know are uh, on, are still accruing um, compared to Zuma 7, which is is closed. Yeah, and the other thing about those studies is um, I believe they allow some or one cycle of salvage chemotherapy, even if they're randomized to the CAR T arm while they're undergoing manufacturing. So, again, it's a little bit different in terms of how these studies are conducted. Uh, so, you know, potentially that adds additional variables. And at the end of the day, um, will we have different results? And then how do you interpret that? Right. And then platform, I know that uh, um, your platform is kind of using uh, the Lysacel product, but then adding um, other arms uh, to it, kind of getting at your, your concept of can you make the CAR T cell uh, better or can you rejuvenate the CAR T cell? Any thoughts? Uh, I know that we both are participating in that from uh, each of our institutions. Yeah, so I think, again, part of it was just to demonstrate feasibility that you can combine uh, JCAR with targeted agents, and those targeted agents are things like BTK inhibitors, cell mod, um, checkpoint inhibitors. And so some of these data have been at least portions, and it's hard to draw any strong conclusions from it, other than it looks like, yes, you can potentially safely do it. 
I think the challenge is always trying to identify which patient is better suited for a combination strategy uh, versus just CAR-T alone. And so I think as we get more and more clinical experience, we'll probably be able to tease out those patients that we have you know, concern that they're probably not going to do as well from a safety and efficacy standpoint, and then that's where a combination strategy might be better. I struggle with anticipating that all future studies are going to be combination approaches uh, to try and enhance efficacy for all patients because, again, we're probably doing a pretty decent job for 40%. It's just those 60% we need to do better. Right. Do you think that it's just the LDH and the SPD you know, defined as a as some as some marker that that identifies that that group, or is that just a start? I think that's probably just large cell specific too. And again, I think those might be surrogates for um, highly proliferative or poorly behaving large cell lymphoma. Uh, so where I've always struggled is when you've had patients that have already failed two or more lines of therapy, it's not like I have a better treatment option sitting in my back pocket that I just haven't pulled out yet. And now all of a sudden I can fix this problem. Now, I do recognize there are emerging treatments that we didn't even have a couple of years ago, like pulituzumab, potentially tafacitumab. But that being said, it's always nerve wracking to me when I have someone with a lot of tumor going into CAR-T, both from a safety and efficacy standpoint. So in those settings, that might be where a combination strategy might help alleviate some of my anxiety about how this patient's going to do. Right. And then Transcend now is uh, um, has mantle cell. I think they reported on um, uh, nine patients uh, previously. And so I think that that's kind of ongoing, um, looking to see if they can, uh, what their kind of durability and response rates will be in relapse refractory mantle cell. We kind of spoke about Transcend CLL. Um, I know that you you have a kind of an in-house NK car uh, that's being looked at, correct? Yeah, so Katie Rizvani uh, has done a tremendous amount of work essentially building NK cars from uh, cord blood that's been stimulated. And so the New England Journal paper was published. It's a relatively small sample size, but it did include a number of different histologies from CLL, follicular, large cell, um, some Richters in, in that study population. Uh, so again, it demonstrates that you can successfully generate a car um, from a cord blood, so essentially again, off the shelf. Uh, and there are with the small sample size, um, pretty promising efficacy. The safety is quite notable. So essentially uh, no patients required ICU care. There's been essentially almost no grade three CRS or neurotoxicity. Uh, and that speaks to the fact that these are NK cells and, and not T cells. Um, the durability, I think, is still the question. A lot of those patients in the phase one had consolidative approaches. Again, I think that speaks to the fact when this was first rolling out, there was concern that these NK cells may not have the durability that we see with the auto uh, car T's. And so a lot of them had consolidation either with transplant um, or targeted therapy or even rituximab. And so I think we need a little bit more information on what happens if you just do the NK car alone or is it, you know, one time infusion or multiple infusions. Uh, but that looks to be very promising. Would do those patients, um, were they allowed to have prior car T cell and then get, if they progress, then get an NK car? Or is there no experience? No, and that's been a lot of discussion that we've had recently. So they couldn't have had any prior CD19 directed therapy. So um, again, essentially the all the available products had been CD19 thus far. Um, there, and you've mentioned this before. There is some discussion that how do you go past an auto CD19 car when you know about the safety and efficacy uh, to try something that's pretty experimental? And so with TCGEN, you could potentially um, collect T cells and freeze them while you pursue some of these novel approaches and have that as sort of your backup plan if, if this is an ineffective strategy. So we've talked about that from an institution. Is this something that we should potentially invest in or have companies invest in uh, where we have a, an Afreeze product that's sitting in storage just in case we need it? Or as you mentioned, could you then design these studies to do after a seating an auto car has failed? Um, Again, there's lots of probably different strategies to employ. I think we will always have new trials, and, and we didn't talk a whole lot about it, but even by specific cars where we're targeting multiple antigens, um, at the end of the day, we just want our patients to do well. And, and if it takes 
novel innovation, then we keep trying. Yeah, I think those have to be tough consent uh, dis discussions, and for you know when you're when you're kind of have multiple options, but you know that you 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 go one route and you can't you do some other some other studies, and so it's kind of interesting now about how we need to maybe relook at how we're writing some of these studies, especially uh, in cellular therapy, to help move the field forward and answer some of those mm -hmm. some of those questions. Um, so I think with the time left that we have, I think we've talked a little bit about uh, tafacitumab, lenalidomide. That data, um, you know, has been presented uh, in the what is it, the the R mind or I think it was L mind, L mind, L mind, and, yeah. and then Remind was the uh, kind of what was presented at ASCO recently with looking at kind of a matched pair uh, study um, showing. Um, that L mind, you know, when matched, um, did, did well compared to kind of a general real world experience with lenalidomide uh, single single agent. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that uh, that aspect? I thought you know it was an interesting way of employing real world uh, data, but um, you know I don't know how often I've given lenalidomide alone. Um, you know, given kind of the data of resensitizing that lenalidomide can resensitize uh, patients to rituximab. Um, I don't know that it had too much to do uh, to do with the results. Um, and then really the breakdown of kind of GCB versus ABC um, wasn't matched uh, um, in that analysis. Yeah, and you mentioned this earlier, this whole notion of who's not a transplant candidate. So that was the phase two study. They tried to target those patients uh, that were not transplant candidates. Um, and the response rates were quite striking. So the PFS was quite striking with tafacitumab in combination with lenalidomide. It's a single arm phase two study and maybe a select patient population because they also excluded those patients that were refractory uh, to treatment. And so at the end of the day, you're left with this phase two data that looks very, very promising. Um, and then how do you sequence it in the midst of what's currently available? And so I think partly why they did the real world analysis was really to try and tease out contribution. You could also look at the L-mine data and think, wow, that did so much better than lenalidomide and rituximab, or at least our experience with lenalidomide and rituximab. Is it truly a superior antibody or is there something really kind of interesting and um, mechanistically new about this combination. So I think that was one attempt to try and answer the question, well, how does this compare to just lenalidomide alone to really get at what's the antibody contributing? But as you mentioned, it's probably challenging to identify patients where you would consider lenalidomide alone. It's probably a little bit of a historical um, situation in that before we saw R squared data emerging, there was a trial uh, led uh, by Chuchman looking at lenalidomide monotherapy um, and then in, in, in versus investigator choice. And it just really was not a, a very strong study, meaning the Len arm did particularly poorly and maybe only in the non-GCB subgroup was there really much activity at all. So um, again, there are lots of different ways to try and tease out what a randomized study would otherwise tell us when you don't have that randomized data to answer the question. Right. And then uh, I've kind of you alluded to some of these uh, CAR T cells that are targeting multiple uh, antigens. So the 1920s, the 1922s, we showed a little data on, on some of them. Uh, um, you know, I, you know, kind of getting at escape mechanisms and whatnot. So I think that's kind of been interesting, also. So I think we have some time, uh, uh, Daria. Do we want to move to some questions? If there are, yeah. Some? So we, yeah. So we have a couple of questions. So this this one's going back to um, our beginning when we were on the Zuma Five. So. What do you feel is driving the higher response rates in Zuma with the indolent lymphomas versus the more aggressive large cell lymphomas like DLBCL? Well, I, th I think particularly with low-grade lymphomas, you have the luxury of time to allow for an immune therapy approach uh, really to demonstrate if it has activity uh, without the patient crashing and burning in front of your eyes. And so I think it is clearly disease specific. Um, I don't know that 
any therapy, if you look even at the bispecific antibodies, you're going to see higher response rates in follicular or low-grade lymphoma than you see with the aggressive lymphomas. And it's probably just the luxury of time that these patients' tumors aren't growing so rapidly uh, that you have to give up on therapy very quickly. Um, there probably is a component, too, of potentially less tumor burden or tumor bulk, and particularly less tumor proliferation, as I just mentioned, that's also potentially contributing uh, to the, the the higher response side of that coin, and, and Matt, I want your opinion on this. Is we also will be very critical then of the durability. I mean, we'll applaud the high, high response rates all day. We'll be less enthusiastic about this approach uh, than we are, say, for large cell lymphoma. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see because this is competing right in the space of the of the randomized kind of cooperative group um, a study potentially also. Uh, um, so, you know, what's kind of, is it going to displace? Is it third line? If the data looks good enough, you know, when are you going to use it? Because it was exploring those pod 24 patients. I think what it was a 66% of them uh, um, had progressed within two years. So you're showing good response rates. It's a durability, you know, comes then I think that this is a game, you know, potential game changer in indolent lymphomas. Uh, um, and then what, you know, what do these patients look like after a CAR T cell relapse? You know, one of the concerns, you know, you'd have, I suppose, is what is the degree of cytopenias uh, in this population? So can't, you know, if they relapse two years from now, did you burn a bridge that you didn't, you know, you can't, now you don't have a bone marrow to treat them. And I, so I think that while the initial efficacy is great, we need to see not only durability in this population, but um, kind of what what does their uh, their bone marrow look like also um, after this, and perhaps with less toxicity, then there's less you know bone marrow. Um, I don't know if you call it cytokine uh, re related uh, suppression or um, uh, dampening, um, but I think that's going to be part of the part of the equation and where this is going to fall out in indolent lymphomas. Great, thank you. And so acknowledging both of you do treat, you know, the lymphomas, um, are you aware of any studies that are in solid tumors with CAR-T? Are there any ones that you, you know are ongoing or enrolling? Yes, yeah, so there have been a number of attempts to look at CAR-T in solid tumor, and as you mentioned, there's several that are underway. I think lymphomas always, and leukemia, have been very easy targets in a sense because you can identify extracellular proteins that are ubiquitously expressed on the tumor cell but not expressed um, on the normal tissue. And so I think we have the luxury of having targets uh, that lend itself very well for efficacy and low risk for toxicity. Whereas in the solid tumor world, that gets to be a little bit more challenging. Um, and great example is HER2, uh, which is something that's been targeted for breast cancer. The problem when you have an effective CAR and you target something like HER2, you're gonna deal with cardiac toxicity probably to greater depth or uh, degree than, than you're probably willing to trade off. So that's always been the limitation in terms of what's underway. Uh, there are studies looking at HPV as uh, associated tumors where you could potentially target again antigens that are driving that process. Um, there are a number of others that are underway as well. Yeah, the gastro was full of kind of cars and in solid tumor uh, too. So it was kind of impressive to type in CAR T cell and search and just see what you what you come up with and probably more than there was in hemolymphocytes it looked like. Great, thanks. So that appears to be all the questions that we have. Again, I want to give a huge thank you to our faculty for joining us for the four weeks. Unfortunately, we did lose uh, Dr. Galal uh, throughout the program due to his technical issues. Um, but I hope everyone in the audience truly enjoyed this program. You will be able to uh, listen back and watch the webinar shortly following. Um, so continue to visit OncLive.com to sign up for our e-newsletters and follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. We will bro be broadcasting more of these webinars to come in the next uh, few months. So again, just sign up for those. Um, that includes our webcast. Thank you and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.